All right, uh, let's start our seminar talk. So today, the speaker is Dr. Dashi Bolim. We'll talk about the actions between various places. Uh, that's what I can speak. Okay. Uh, thank you for attending my talk. Uh, this is very elementary, as uh, you can see from the announcement, just uh, involving much valuable calculus and linear algebra. But I, I feel very interesting about the such elementary topics. Now, uh, I will talk about uh, suggestions uh, between uh, Euclidean space, and uh, uh, we will provide a new proof of the changing valuable formula for multi-valuable uh, uh, integrals. And as a result, we uh, obtained the Bravel fixed point theorem uh, immediately. Uh, so first thing, we will uh, review some uh, differential calculus, and then we pr uh, prove our two part of the result. Uh, the, uh, so uh, <clears throat> in Euclidean space, we know that a vector has an Euclidean norm, which is uh, the square root of the square of the sum of the co coordinates. Then we consider a vector valued function, uh, F defined uh, on a subset of Rn. And uh, suppose A is an interior point of U, then uh, we said F is differentiable at A if we can find a metric cut A so that uh, the the, uh, the approach mention is true, uh, okay? Then this metric A is unique, uh, and uh, it's called the derivative of F A, A and then we denote by F prime A and uh, of D F A. Now, how to determine the metric A? Uh, we take, this, this equality is a vector equality. We take the I's uh, components. So suppose the component of F is F1, Fn, then the I component of the equality is this equality. Then this means that, uh, the component fi is uh, differentiable at a, and uh, the ai is the a row, uh, the i rows of the metric a, which is the gradient of fi. Therefore, the metric a is uh, 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 computed here. That is this uh, Jacobian metric. And in the case that n equal to m, this is a square metric, and we have the determinant, which is the Jacobian determinant. Okay, that uh, we learned this from much valuable calculus. And uh, uh, so to compute the derivative is easy. The linear property, okay, the derivative of linear combinations equals the linear combination of their derivative. This is easy. But uh, uh, we use the uh, we 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 need the com uh, composition, the derivative of composition. So suppose u uh, is a subset of R m and uh, f is defined over u and the g is defined over V, which is a subset of uh, Rm, if the range of F is contained in the domain of G, we have the composition, uh, which is a new vector valued function. Naturally, uh, we expect this, this uh, to be differentiable if both F and G are differentiable. So we have this trend rule. If F is differentiable at A, and the G is differentiable at the corresponding point, that is the image of A and the F, B, then the composition is differentiable. And the, the, the uh, derivative of the composition at A equals the composition of their derivatives, okay? Then uh, if we write uh, Y to be the independent variable, U is the intermediate variable, and uh, X is the independent variable, then uh, the, the result of that here, this equality can be expressed using matrix. Uh, the Jacobian matrix of Y, which is respect to X, is the product of uh, the matrix for Y, which is respect to U, uh, multiplying the Jacobian metric of U, which is respect to X. Uh, in component, you have the uh, equality there. This is all and well known in multi valuable calculus. But uh, the next question is why we need to study uh, derivatives? Uh, uh, as we know, derivative is, is a linear approximation. So we expect that uh, if the derivative, that is A, or F plan A, has some property, we expect that F itself locally also. Uh, also has that property, okay? This is uh, best expressed, uh, demonstrated in the inverse function theorem. So suppose omega is open set in Rm, and the f is uh, C1 over omega, also taking value in Rm, and the a is a point in uh, omega. And uh, if the Jacobian determinant of f at a, that is the determinant of f prime a is not zero. Uh, this means that f prime a as a linear map from Rm to itself is a, uh, an isomorphic, it's invertible. So uh, the linearization is uh, invertible. We expect F is invertible, of course, locally, because the differentiability as well as the uh, derivative depend only on the local behavior of F near A. 
Okay, so we expect F is locally uh, invertible. This is true, guaranteed by this inverse function theorem. Uh, more precisely, we have an open set U containing A, open neighborhood of A, capital U, an open neighborhood of B, the image of A, that is capital V. So the F is a projection between U and V. Uh, therefore, it is invertible. Moreover, the inverse is also differentiable. That is to say the F is a diffeomorphism from U to V. Uh, this is just the inverse function theorem. Uh, as I said, this uh, illustrated the basic idea of a differential calculus. Uh, the, what the, what uh, the, the derivative has some property, then the map F, the nonlinear map F, F itself has that property, uh, invertible locally. Okay. Uh, so as a corollary of the inverse function theorem, we have the local subjection theorem. Uh, uh, the inverse function theorem there, which is the case that the domain and the co-domain has the same dimension n. Now, sometimes we need to consider a map from n dimensional to n dimensional. Uh, the, dom the dimensions are not the same, but we still have some similar result. Uh, so if the if the length of the derivative at a is n equal to the dimension of the core domain, that is to say, f plus a as a linear map from Rm to Rn is subjective. Then f is locally subjective. Locally subjective means that the image of a, that is b, is an interior point of the range of f, that is f omega. Uh, why this is, is the local subjectivity? Because b is an interior point in f omega, means that all points near b are also in the uh, in are also in f omega. That is locally, that is what local subjectivity means. Okay. Uh, and uh, the proof of this theorem uh, is also very easy. Uh, we, we, we want to convert this uh, problem involving a map between different dimensions to the case for the inverse function theorem, which requires the two domains has the same dimension. We just uh, uh, just uh, uh, complement some component to construct from the small f to a capital f between n dimension to n dimension. Okay, using this chip, then uh, the capital f is a map from Rm, uh, open set in Rm to Rm. Therefore, we can consider it's a Jacobian metric which is invertible. Uh, which is a square metric. Uh, therefore, you can apply the, the inverse function theorem to this capital F. Okay, that's, yeah, therefore, it's easier. I will not uh, talk about more detail here. Now, that is a uh, warm up. Uh, we review some basic facts about uh, differential calculus. Next, we will start our first topic about the subjectivity of a map between Euclidean space. This is motivated by the fundamental theorem of algebra. As we know, that the fundamental theorem of the algebra says that if small p is a uh, no constant polynomial of order the n, then then the polynomial has at least one zero in the complex plane. Okay, that is the fundamental theorem of uh, algebra. Uh, the first proof seems to be given by Gauss more than three hundred years ago. But uh, interestingly, uh, up to now, there are new proofs uh, uh, produced uh, by about by more modern people. Uh, here is two paper. Here are two paper published in two thousand and uh, two thousand ten. Uh, and uh, uh, all these papers are in uh, American Mathematics uh, Pro Monthly. And uh, also, uh, I can say that uh, the usual proof is uh, based on complex analysis. For example, uh, uh, every textbook on complex variable analysis will, uh, will con uh, contain the proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra uh, to illustrate the power of complex analysis. And also we have many other proofs such as using a green theorem from uh, multivaluable calculus. Uh, also uh, this paper in 2010, using Fourier inverse transform, uh, the arrow is not me, uh, it's the Professor Lazar, University of Miami. Huh? And uh, uh, our work is uh, motivated by the work of Sun uh, in 2000, uh, who used the uh, inverse function theorem to give a uh, a proof of the fundamental theory of algebra, but uh, the proof relies on rely on some uh, topological concepts. In particular, open subset in a subspace, uh, a subset of uh, the complex plane, uh, considered as a subspace of the complex plane. Then you need to work with the open subset and the connectivity of in that subspace. Uh, therefore, this is somewhat uh, not uh, convenient for some students. Uh, not uh, start, uh, have not uh, study topology. Therefore, we want to avoid such a subspace topology. Uh, that is our motivation. Uh, so uh, we want to restrict to uh, real analysis. Therefore, we uh, 
write the complex number z and the pz uh, by the real part and the imaginary part, then uh, the polynomial can be considered as a map from uh, the two-dimensional real plane to itself, uh, px1, uh, component u on the way. Then using the cos Lehman equation, uh, it is clear that p prime z, the complex derivative equals to zero, if and only if the det Jacobian determinant of the p as a map from R2 to R2 is zero. In other words, the point x, y is a critical point of this map. So, and moreover, uh, uh, the, 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 the derivative of p, that is p prime, is a polynomial of order n minus one. It has at most n minus one zeros. So the map p here from R2 to R2 has at most n minus one critical points, okay? On the other hand, p is not constant. So when x, y goes to infinity, uh, the, the norm of p, x, y will, will uh, goes to positive infinity. So this reminds us a classical result in uh, uh, calculus, uh, which says that if f is a map from rn to rn, which is cohesive, meaning that this limit is positive infinity. Um, if such map satisfies this condition, the Jacobian determinant is not zero everywhere. That means this map has no critical point, okay? Then this map is subjective, okay? Why subjective is important? Because if you can prove that our P is subjective, there will be some X, Y, so that P, X, Y is zero. So the complex number, which is real part X, imaginary part Y, is the zero of our polynomial. The fundamental theorem of algebraic, uh, of algebra is proved. So subjectivity is closely related to solving nonlinear equations. Okay, that is our uh, motivation. But uh, this theory, this property could not be applied to our P because our P can has a finite remaining zero. On the other hand, this result requires that the map has no uh, critical point. Our P can have in, uh, ha can has finite remaining critical point, but uh, this result requiring that the map has no critical point. Uh, so this map, uh, this, this result could not be applied to our P. So. But we want to prove our fundamental theory of algebra. Therefore, uh, we observe that if we can weaken this condition, uh, you require the map to be critical point free, no critical point. If you can relax this condition, allowing the map to have finitely many critical point. Uh, if you uh, weaken this condition and the, the subjectivity conclusion is still true, then the fundamental theorem of algebra is simply a corollary of our more general result. Okay, that is our motivation. Moreover, this coincidence means that the range of F is a closed subset of Rn. Therefore, we also don't need this closeness. Uh, we also don't need this coincidence uh, assumption. Uh, that is our result. And, and the map, our result also uh, dealt with the case that F is not a map from Rn to Rn. It is a map between different Euclidean space. So we need to generalize the concept of a critical point uh, for map between different uh, between space of a different dimension. So F is uh, Rn to Rn, C1, and the A is a critical point if the uh, if the FA is not subjective. In other words, the, the length of the Jacobian metric is less than the uh, dimension of the uh, core domain, less than N. In that case, we call A a critical point. Uh, otherwise, A is not critical point, regular point. So uh, we, we, we just, uh, after we review the in those function theory, we already mentioned this local subjection uh, result, which says that uh, if uh, if uh, f if dfa is subjective, in other words, if a is not a critical point of f, then fa is uh, interior to f omega. We, we already we, we just uh, review this result. This result is useful, and we will use this result. Moreover, I want to demonstrate how this result uh, lead to the Lagrange multiplier theorem, multiplier theorem. So in Lagrange multiplication, we want to find each extremal value of f, which is unconstrained, uh, described by g1 equals to zero, gn equals to zero. Okay, how to deal with this problem? Well, suppose uh, n is the set satisfying the constraint condition, that is the manifold in the space. If x zero is the solution of this problem, then that means that you have an open neighborhood of x zero, so that all point x in the intersection of n and the neighborhood u, uh, the value of f at the point is no less than the value at the x0, okay? So we have an open neighborhood of x0, u. Then we construct a map come to f, which is from u to rn plus one. Uh, the, the map come to f is defined using the function f under the n 
concentrate on G1, G2, 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 okay? Uh, so once we have a map, uh, we want to compute its derivative at the point x0. So the, the f point x0 is the metric uh, whose rows are the gradient of f and the g1, g2, uh, up to gn. Then we compute its rank. Uh, we claim that the rank of this metric is n. Once you know that the rank is n, because uh, the assumption of the Lagrange multiplier method uh, require that the, the gradient of g1, gn are uh, linearly independent at the point. Therefore, once the, the rank of the metric is n, then the first row, that is the gradient of f, is a linear combination of uh, the gradient of g1, gn. Therefore, uh, that is the result of Lagrange multiplier theorem. Therefore, why the rank is n? If the rank is not n, it must be n plus one. Because we know that the, the last n rows are linearly independent. Okay, so if the if the rank is not n, it must be n plus one. In that case, x zero is not a x zero is not a, a critical point of a capital F. Therefore, uh, the image of x zero and the capital F, that is this point, is an integral point of the range of capital F. Therefore, we can find a ball very small centering at this point, and at this point whose uh, first coordinate is slightly uh, less than fx0, and the whose last n coordinates are zero, then this point would be in the range of capital F. Therefore, the pre image of this point lying in the intersection of u and n. But the value of the value of a small f at the point, the value of a small f at the point is here, is less than fx0, which is a contradiction that x0 is a concentrated minimizer of the small f. Therefore, completing the proof of uh, the Lagrange multiplier theorem, uh, I feel this proof very interesting. Uh, okay. Now let's go back to our subject subjection. Our result is this uh, result published in 2018. Uh, so our map is a map from Rm to Rn, which has one finite many critical points, and the uh, and the the range is closed. Uh, the range of f is closed, which is weaker than the uh, cohesiveness assumption that the limit is infinity, okay? Then uh, we, the result is that the map is uh, is uh, subjective. The range is the whole Rn. Uh, know that the, the con this closeness, this closeness assumption is a necessary condition for this result, okay? If it is Rn, it is of course closed. Therefore, only the finite many critical points uh, counts. And the, of course, we require the uh, n at least two. If n is one, this result is not true. Okay. Uh, in other words, f must be a vector valued function. Now, the proof of this theorem is very easy. Actually, this is a collaboration uh, of which uh, undergraduate student. Uh, so, uh, so uh, let k be the critical, the set of all critical points of f. Uh, then our assumption says that k is a finite set. Therefore, the image of k, that is fk, is also finite. Uh, on the other hand, uh, because k is finite, it is closed. Therefore, the complement of k is open. So, uh, and moreover, for every point in the complement x, x will not be a critical point. So, the dfx must be subjective. Okay? x is not critical, so dfx is subjective. Therefore, using this local subjection theorem, fx, the range of uh, the, the image of x and f, is an integral point of the image of the complement of k and f, the set will be noted by a. And every point in a is of this form, fx. In other words, every point in a is inter integral. So a is an open set, OK? Uh, a is an open set. On the other hand, the union of a and uh, fk, the image of k, uh, by the left computation, the union of a and fk is precisely the range of f the whole FRM. So we have an open set, no empty open set. Adding finite many points in it, you get the whole space. Uh, uh, sorry, you get this FRM. Um, but the FRM has the property. FRM is closed, therefore FRM equals the crucial. The crucial is uh, contain, uh, it's bigger than the crucial of A, okay? So if you know that the crucial of A is the whole space Rn, then FRM must equals to Rn, okay? A is open. Uh, adding finitely many points, you get a, a, a set which is uh, dense in the space, okay? Then we, uh, sorry, adding finitely many points, it becomes closed. Uh, the, the, the union of A and FK is closed. Then we claim that A is dense. 
Uh, okay. Uh, so the, the product will reduce to this uh, statement. Uh, uh, the union of an open set which finite set is closed. Uh, then it must be the whole. The, it must be dense in the space. Uh, okay. Once this is true, then the, the theorem is proved. Uh, this is the, the less the lemma. So A is no empty, and uh, if there are finitely many points adding to A, it becomes closed. Then we claim that the closure of A is the whole Rn. Once this is true, because the closure of A is Rn, therefore from this inclusion we know that Frn equals Rn. Ah, that, that, then the theorem is proved. Okay, so let's prove this lemma. Uh, so uh, firstly, A is open, so it has an empty intersection which is boundary. On the other hand, because assumption says that this is closed, therefore this equals the exclusive. And the, the, the closure of this union equals the union of their closure. And the closure of A is the union of A and the is boundary. Therefore, we have this equality. Okay? Ah. The, the closure of the union equals the union of their closure. The closure of A is A and the, is the union of A and the is boundary. And the closure of the finite dimensional point is simply the finite point set itself. So we have this result. And the, combine this equality and the that A has empty intersection, which is the boundary. We conclude that the boundary is contained in the point set PI. Therefore, A has only finitely many boundary points. Okay? Ah. For our assumption, A has only finitely many boundary points. Now, we want to prove that A is uh, dense in the space. If there is a point not in the closure of A, so suppose there is some B which is not in the closure of A, then we can take a small A in A. Then because A is open, therefore this small A is an interior point. So you can you can take a ball, small ball, centering an A and the contact in capital A. And uh, you uh, through this center A, you can draw a segment because our dimension is at least two. Uh, you can draw a segment which is not parallel to the segment linking A and B. Okay. And uh, obviously for every point in this segment, this pink segment, X, uh, the, the segment linking X to B has an contains a boundary point. This X is in the interior of A, and the B is uh in the uh, it is in the complement of the closure of A. So in this segment, there must be a boundary point. Maybe more than one. We just take one divided by x bar. But because there are infinitely many points in this pink segment, uh, and the different point corresponds to different boundary points. So this means that A must have infinitely many boundary points. If the closure of A is not the whole space, A will have infinitely many boundary points. A contradiction to our previous observation that it has only finitely many. Okay, therefore the dilemma is true. So the, the our subjectivity result is uh, verified. Okay, and uh, of course uh, the fundamental theory of algebra is just a corollary of our result. Now all these arguments are local, so we can generalize this to the manifold. So we have the corollary uh, replacing the domain R n by an n-dimensional smooth manifold, then the result is also true. A map defined over the n-dimensional manifold uh, has, if it has only finitely many critical points and the, the range is closed, then it must be a subjection, okay? That is the first uh, corollary. The second corollary, uh, if n is more of a closed, uh, compact, if n is compact, then the closeness of the range, the closeness of fn is automatic. Okay, M is compact. Fm is also compact, therefore closed. So, for example, there is no the open ball mm. in R two. Yeah, there is. There are no. There is no possible finite number of points such that that many of those points is closed. Sorry. Mm. If you have, a, if we, have, if we have, a, if we have a ball, mm. an open ball. Yeah. It is not possible to find. Finitely many points, such as the ball, yeah. and in these points. Yeah, closed. right. The union of the ball, of, right. the, of course, not closed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Now, let's go back. Uh, the, the second corollary uh, if n is compact, then the closeness of the range is automatically true. Therefore, uh, this, this corollary simply says that any vector valued function defined over a compact manifold must have infinitely many critical points. Okay. 
uh, that is uh, our first part, the subjectivities of map uh, of uh, maps between Euclidean space. Now let's go to the second topic about our proof of the changing variable formula uh, for multi-variable and uh, multiple integrals. So this proof is motivated by an exercise in the uh, differential geometry book of Tokamo, a uh, very famous book. Uh, uh, in that exercise, the changing variable formula for double integral uh, is proved using Green theory. Okay, now we just generalize the idea to a higher dimension. So uh, for this purpose, we have to use the mathematical induction. We assume that the changing variable formula is true for n minus one dimension, so that we can define the uh, surface integral using n minus one dimensional uh, multiple uh, volume integral. Then we establish the divergent theorem. Then uh, Tokamo use a uh, Green theorem to prove two dimensional formula. We use the general divergent theorem to prove the n dimensional one. That is the idea. So we need to we need some concept. First, the, the parametric surface. Uh, a parametric surface is just a regular map x from some u in n minus one dimension to n dimension. Uh, uh, regular means that the range of the Jacobian metric is n minus one. Uh, x prime, the Jacobian metric of this map x is a uh, uh, n minus one times n matrix. Uh, we require that it has the maximum rank, that is n minus one. Moreover, because you want this x to be a parametrization of a map, uh, this x has to be injected uh, in the interval of u, not, not on the whole u. Uh, what, what's Jordan measurable again? Sorry? What, what's Jordan measurable? Oh, Jordan measurable. Uh, that is a, a very basic concept when you're uh, talking about Riemannian geometry, uh, Riemannian integral, multiple integral. That is some subset in Euclidean space. You can talk about uh, its, vo its, its area, its volume, uh, less general than the bigger measure. Okay, okay. And when, uh, when we study the uh, bigger integral, we define the bigger measurable set. Okay, but when we study Riemann integrals, Ah, we need Jordan measurable set. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, but, uh, to explain this, I, this concept is a long story. We could not present it here. Oh. Okay. Uh, you, that's just some some good subset. Uh, you can talk about the the vo the top area, the volume. Okay. Oh. So that is the parametric surface, which is a map. Okay. Then two such map, two such parametric surface, uh, we call them equivalent. If they are different up to a homeomorphism, if there is a homo diffeomorphism B, uh, between them, so that uh, x tilde is the composition of x and b, then we say that x and x tilde are equivalent. Obviously, this is an equivalent relation. So uh, observing that once they are equivalent, they have the same emerge. Their emerge is a subset of Rm. Okay, the map is mapped into Rm. Therefore, their emerge is a subset of Rm, which is the geometric surface. Okay, so different uh, equivalent different uh, element in the equivalent class is simply different parametrization of the same geometric surface. Okay, so we can identify the, the equivalent class which the image of any of the map x in the equivalent class uh, as uh, x u. Okay, we can identify the, the image that is the subset in m dimensional space, the geometric surface which the equivalent class. Uh, then. Uh, we also need a normal vector for such a, a parametric surface. So as suppose the surface S has a parametrization given by X, then we know that the, uh, a normal vector of S is given by this capital N. This is a generalization of our well-known result in three dimensional. If the surface is X equal X U root, Y equal Y U root, Z equal Z U root, then we know that the normal vector is Y Z by U root. They echo by the root and the x1. Okay, uh, this is we don't know in uh, calculus, multivariable calculus, uh, but uh, this is just the higher dimensional counterpart of that result. Uh, uh, and uh, the proof is also easy using Clamo uh, rule. Uh, it is very easy. I, I, I will not uh, explain more detail here. Then, once you know the normal vector determined by the parametrization of the surface, we can define the, the surface integral for any continuous function defined over the geometric surface S. Uh, the surface integral is defined using the parametrization X. 
but uh, our induction assumption that n minus one dimensional changing variable formula is true. This implies that the right hand side does not depend on the parametrization x. So this is defined. This definition is well defined. Okay, so we define the service integral just using uh, a parametrization and uh, using the corresponding n minus one dimensional volume integral to define the surface integral. Okay, that is for small uh, a piece of a surface. If S is a piecewise smooth, meaning that the surface is a union of some finitely many such surfaces, uh, which are disjoint internally, meaning that uh, the, 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 the image of the integral has empty intersection. In that case, we simply integrating it, each pieces and then summing them up. Okay, this is the definition of, of f over the piecewise smooth surface sigma. Uh, once you introduce the surface integral, uh, it is not difficult to prove the divergent theorem, saying that if b is a good domain, uh, boundary is piecewise smooth, and the capital F is a um, uh, C1 vector field, then the divergent, the, in, the volume integral of the divergent over domain equals the uh, surface integral of the dot product of the vector field, which is the unit outward normal term. That is the divergent theory. Uh, in particular, you have also you also have this equality. Uh, if you take the capital F whose i's component is the small f, the other components are zero. Then this divergent theory, this equality reduced to that equality. Okay, this is uh this are what we need to prove our n-dimensional changing variable theory. So and now let's start to proving our theory, uh, the, uh, presenting our proof of that theory. So firstly, we consider the so-called simple domain. A bounded domain is called a simple if the surface, if the boundary of the domain can be covered by a single uh Parametrization. For example, the balls, the balls in any dimension uh, is simple. For example, in the three-dimensional case, uh, uh, three-dimensional sub the, the surface of the ball is a sphere, which can be parametrized by using this map. This map, this map is related interiorly, uh, okay, and also injective. Of course, uh, because we allow this to be Closed, therefore, actually, this covers the whole surface, uh, the whole sphere. Okay, uh, so so that is uh, both are simple, but uh, some some other uh, domain is not simple. For example, the cylinder is not is not simple. I think uh, the surface consists of the two discs, the bottom and the top, as well as the cylindrical surface around it. Therefore, maybe you need three uh, parametrization to cover the boundary of the cylinder. Therefore, cylinder is not simple. Okay, the cube is also not simple. But uh, for example, balls are simple. Okay, then for simple domain, uh, we have this uh, uh, changing variable formula. Uh, D and uh, omega are open uh, bounded, and uh, which is say one boundary, and the omega is simple. And uh, the transformation from omega bar from the cross of omega to the cross of D. Uh, maps the boundary of omega homeomorphically to the boundary of D. Okay, the transformation here don't need to be uh, does not need to be a, a, a homeomorphism of the domain, just uh, over the boundary. In other words, some point in inside can maps from some different point inside omega can be mapped to, to the same point in D. We don't require the D to be one by one, one to one. It, it, it only need to be good uh, over the surface, over the boundary. Okay, only need to map the boundary of omega to the boundary of D diffeomorphically. Then we have this uh, changing variable formula. Okay, this is very important to get the Blauvel distance theorem. So standard map I know that. Uh, so uh, here our our integral, the function f is continuous, but using some modifier, we, we might assume that f is uh, the restriction to the Plus of D of some smooth function in the whole space Rn. Okay, this is, this can be assumed. Uh, in that, therefore, uh, we can pick a uh, say one function whose partial derivative with respect to the first variable is our integral f. Okay, firstly, we we we, we can sim simplify the problem. We just need to study smooth map smooth function f. Okay, but the result by approximation by by smooth approximation the result is also true for 
for uh, continuous function only, okay? Secondly, as I remarked, phi only good on the boundary. Uh, uh, if only need to map the boundary of omega to that of D diffeomorphically, it can map different point inside, interior point, different interior point map to the same point. It don't need to be one-to-one, -one, okay? Uh, and uh, why we are interested in uh, uh, such a formula? Because uh, even recently, uh, some famous mathematicians such as Peter Lux, uh, Peter Lux has written two papers on this topic. Uh, and also the Tyro and the, uh, even not other mathematicians, they published papers about the change variable formula. Okay. Uh, for example, the result of the 99 result of Lux, it says that if F, uh, if the transformation B is identical outside some big ball, then you have the result. Uh, obviously, that requiring B to be identical, be, to be identity is a very a very serious restriction. Okay. Therefore, uh, Okay, that is why we uh, are interested in this problem. Of course, I teach uh, analysis. So when I teach the changing variable formula for multi-variable function, I could not find a satisfactory proof. That is also another motivation. Okay, now let's go to prove this theorem. Uh, so uh, so we, we have the, some pictures here. So phi is the transformation from omega to D. We assume that the component of phi uh, the point in D is denoted by Y. The point in X is denoted by X. Therefore, B, the, uh, if you write a map, the transformation B in components, uh, it is uh, M function, Y1, Y2, Yn, are uh, functions of X1, Xn. Okay? Then we take the capital P, which is C1, uh, whose passive derivative, which is respect to Y1, is F. Then P is considered as a function defined on D, whose positive derivative is our integral F. And uh, P theta is the composition of P and P. Uh, that is a P2 part. Then our assumption is that uh, omega is simple. The boundary of omega can be covered by a single parametrization. Suppose X is that parametrization of the boundary of omega. Then because of phi is a uh, diffeomorphism between the two boundaries. So the composition of the composition of uh, the composition of phi and X, X is a map from n minus one dimension to and dimensional space whose, whose range is the boundary of omega. Phi is a diffeomorphism between the two boundaries. Therefore, their composition, that is this blue mark, Y, is a parametrization of the boundary of D. Okay? Ah, the composition is a parametrization of the boundary of D. Then once you has a uh, once you have a parametrization of a surface, then you can write down the normal vector. Okay? Ah, the three-dimensional case is on the board. But the general case is here. You have a parametrization. You have a formula for computing the normal vector. Then you you normalize the normal vector. This is small n. Uh, if if necessary, you reverse the direction. Uh, this small n is the unit outward normal vector. The small n. The small n is not uh, outward normal. Uh, of course, this is capital N. Maybe capital N point inside. Then you need to reverse the direction. That is why I need the negative sign here. Okay, and when you denote by n one n n the n components of this small n, then we introduce another two vector field. One is capital A, whose components are a one a n and the n theta. Capital A is given by uh, this Jacobian uh, matrix a determinant up to a sign. This is the Jacobian determinant of a y two y n, which is respect to x one x n minus one. X and minus n plus one up to xn. The xi here means that we, we, we don't consider xi. Okay, that is ai, the component of this capital A. And similarly, n i theta, the component of n theta, the component of n theta is given by the Jacobian uh, determinant of xi, uh, x1, xn, uh, without xi, which is respect to u1, the parameters u1, u2, un minus one up to the side. Then you can see that the, the n theta is explicitly normal vector of the boundary of omega given by the parametrization x. Remember our formula for computing the normal vector from a parametrization of a surface. Okay, then you see that the n theta is precisely normal vector out a uh, normal vector of the boundary of omega. Again, you normalize it, you get a small n theta up to the sign, which is a outward no, unit normal vector. Okay, then we want to compute the uh, n1, 
we want to compute the first first component of n tuta, the first component of n tuta, which is an n one tuta divided by the norm. Uh, and we want to compute this quantity n one times the norm. Now n one is the first component of n tuta. Multiplying the norm of n tuta is the first component of n tuta, which is n one tuta. Okay, which is which is the uh this Jacobian determinant. How to compute this Jacobian determinant? Uh, why is a function, sorry, why is a function of X? X is a function of U. Therefore, to compute the Jacobian determinant of Y, which is respect to U, you need to use the chain rule. Okay. Uh, so by the chain rule, we have uh, by the chain rule, we know that the Jacobian metric for Y, which is respect to U, equals to the Jacobian metric for Y, which is respect to X times X, which is respect to U. We have this equality by chain law. Ah, okay. Correct? Now, just the chain law. We, we, we don't consider y1. Okay. So we only consider y2 up to yn. Then using chain law, we have this metric equality. Uh, the quantity we want to compute is the determinant of the left hand side. But uh, the right hand side is not a product of two square metric. How to compute the determinant? Uh, we have the Cauchy ability formula, which says that. Ah, uh, you remove this color, remove the i column for the match first matching under the i's row for the second matching. Then both of these two matches becomes square matching. You can compute their determinant. Then their product, summing them from i up to i from one to n. The, the sum of all these product is the determinant of the product matching. That is cosy finite the formula. Ah, uh, you remove this. This becomes n minus one, n minus one matching. You remove this row. This is also n minus one and n minus one matching. Therefore, the product of their determinant that is here. Okay. Removing this column means that you remove xi here. Removing this row means that you remove xi here. Then their product, that is the i term. You sum i from one to n. The result is the determinant of the product matching. That is what we want. Okay, using chain law and the Cauchy Binet formula, we, we, we have this last formula here. Then let's go back to our computation. Then, as I said, uh, this equals this. This is exactly the dot product of A and N tuta. Remember our component of A and N tuta. Uh, this sum is just the dot product. Okay, then using the divergent theorem, the integral of f over d, f is the partial derivative of t by y1. Uh, then using the divergent theorem, this is the surface integral of t times the first component of the uh, normal vector, unit normal over the boundary of d. That is n1. Then the boundary of d has a parametrization. So this surface integral can be computed using the parametrization, reduced to a n minus 1 dimensional volume integral over the, the, the domain of the parameters. U. Okay. So this integral can uh, reduce to n minus one dimensional volume integral using the parametrization of the of the surface, the boundary of D. Okay. Then <coughs> we observe that the composition of P and the Y uh, by simple composition. This is just the composition of P tuta and X. So P Y U can be rewritten by P tuta X U. Okay, and the n one times the norm of capital N. Now, n one times the norm of capital N <coughs> is the total product of a and n tuta. So we get this result. Okay, then n tuta is the norm of itself multiplying its uh, directional vector small n tuta. So we can rewrite this uh, integral in this way. Uh, p tuta times a. A is a vector. P tuta is a scalar. Therefore, P tilde times A is a vector. The dot product of this vector, which is the directional vector of n tilde, that is a small n tilde, multiply the norm of capital n tilde. Uh, these two are the same. Then the last uh, the n minus one volume integral is precisely the, uh, the surface integral of this function, P tilde A dot n tilde over the boundary of omega. Okay? Uh, this is just the boundary, the, the, the surface integral over the boundary of omega. 
because uh, the boundary of omega has a parametrization using the small x. The small x is a map from couple u to the boundary of omega, which is the parametrization. Uh, so this service integral, if you write into uh, using the parametrization, write it into uh, n minus one dimensional volume integral, it is precisely this one. So these two are, are the same. Now, the, 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 the volume integral over D has been converted into the uh, surface integral over the boundary of omega. Uh, and the integral of this surface integral is very nice. Uh, it's a dot product of some vector field, which the outward no, unit normal vector. We can apply the divergent theorem to this surface integral again to convert it into a surface integral. That is the divergent of our vector field. Okay, So it remains to compute this divergent. This divergent. Uh, this is not that difficult. So to, to compute this divergent, uh, we first write down the uh, Jacobian metric, Jacobian determinant for y, which is respect to x, uh, which is this n by n determinant. Then we observe that our AI, AI is precisely the algebraic core factor of this element in red. Uh, the first row, the i is column. You remove this row, remove this column, then you get an n minus one square uh, metric. The determinant uh, multiply like one times uh, up to uh, to one plus i, which is just AI. So AI is just the algebraic core vector. Then uh, we have a um, Hadama identity, which says that the divergence of the vector field A is zero. Uh, uh, at this step, we need the transformation to be say two. Uh, uh, the, 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 the second order, the parcel derivative have, uh, is independent of the, the order. So you can get this divergent uh, free equality. Then you expand this determinant uh, according to its line, its G line. So y i g times a i, summing them up. When g equals one, the result is precisely the determinant. If g is not one, the result is zero. Okay. Expanding this determinant corresponding to the G row, corresponding to the G row. If you expand corresponding to, to the first row, you get a determinant. If if we do that for the G row, because the AI are algebraic core factor of the first line, the result is zero. Okay, so we have this result. Then ah, our divergent, it is clear that the divergent of the scalar times A equals the, the dot product of the gradient of the scalar function and the, the vector field plus the p uh, the scalar times the divergent of A. But the divergent of A is zero, so we simply have the dot product of the gradient of p and the A. The dot product, of course, equals to the, the sum of the, the product of the corresponding components. So the puzzle P theta, puzzle XI is the i's component of the gradient. And the, the AI is the i's component of A. Therefore, you have this result. Then P theta is a function of X, which is a composition of P and the X and the and the and the P. Okay. P theta is the component. P theta, P is a function of Y. Y is a function of X. Their composition is P theta. So when you compute the Pass the derivative here, you can apply the chain law. Uh, so you get this result. Uh, then the, the two sum you can switch the order of the summation. Uh, uh, here we start the Shibu. sum which is respect to It's already 48, so you have to hurry up. Oh, oh yeah, yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, we, we will switch the order. Switch the order, we get this result. Then then uh then this using this result, when is the, the term corresponding to g equal to one survive? You have p by y1, then determinant. But the, the, this is just f, positive derivative of p, which is uh, y1 is f, so that is the result. Therefore, the divergence is precise with the integral of the changing value formula. Therefore, our result uh, follows. Okay. okay, so this is all done under the assumption that f is smooth, right? And now we can use multiplication, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Okay. So uh, since time is uh, uh, quickly, I will skip the general uh, the discussion about general domain. I, I, I want to use the last page. This is the last page about the Broder fixed point theorem. So uh, Broder fixed point theorem says that any continuous map from a closed border itself has continue, uh, has a fixed point. Uh, and uh, it is essentially based on this proposition, which says that there is no uh, say two map from the ball uh, whose, whose length is contained in the surface and uh, who, uh, and, and, uh, a fixed uh, point, uh, 
Well, most of these chips into the bundle is the identity map. Uh, once the, this proposition is true, the probability is point zero is true. Now to prove this theorem, we consider this function f, uh, which is zero near the boundary, okay, and which is positive uh, within the the smaller door which radius the half. Okay, this function has this property. Therefore, the composition of f and the composition is zero because the three x is on the boundary and the f is zero on the boundary. So we always have this uh, equality. Then because the three is identity identity map over the boundary, therefore it is a diffeomorphism on the boundary. So our theorem apply. So we can consider this D uh, as uh, the transformation. Then firstly, because F is non-negative and positive somewhere, as well as continuous. So the volume integral of F over D is positive. On the other hand, when you change variable, this this sub uh, this uh, volume integral equals the volume integral by x, but this this factor of the integral is zero, so the result is zero. So this is a contradiction. Oh, okay, this contradiction part that our proposition is true. Therefore, the global physics point of view is also true. So uh, I have to stop here. Thank you.